Hi, and welcome to Spooky Hours. My name's David Saunderson. Uh, we're in Halloween week here, and we're very, very delighted to be speaking to a gentleman who has had a, a big effect on uh, Halloween lives here in the UK uh, over the last few decades. The person we're talking to is Stephen Volk. Stephen was uh, the writer behind the infamous Ghostwatch BBC television uh, special that uh, aired on Halloween night in 1992. Now, it's the 30th anniversary of uh, Ghost Watch, and uh, we've run a couple of stories about it in recent times on the Spooky Owls, and every time we do it, people get very excited. It's obviously uh, uh, really um, brought up emotions from that night because it was on that night that uh, it was it was a, a mockumentary. It wasn't meant to be taken seriously, but for some reason, a lot of people didn't realise it was a... a you know, a made-up documentary, a mockumentary, and it scared the living um, the daylights out of a lot of people. And apparently, there was a, a million, a million phone calls to the BBC that night to make complaints or whatever other reasons you'd want to call a, a TV station for. So we're going to talk to Stephen. Stephen's had a brilliant career as a horror writer, but being the 30th anniversary and being Halloween week, what else do we want to talk about? So. Tonight, tonight, we're going to be talking to Stephen Volk about Ghostwatch and the legacy of 30 years. Hello, Stephen. How are you today? Hi, how are you? Good to be here. Yeah, it's, good. it's great to have you here. And as I said before, it's uh, the 30th anniversary of Ghostwatch. Did you ever think that you're going to be sitting somewhere 30 years in the future actually talking on a computer when the, nowadays you could never imagine to be scared by something as, uh, as well, simple as... First of all, I, I can imagine sitting uh, on, a, on a computer screen having a conversation with someone. I certainly can imagine that. But uh, I wouldn't imagine talking about it either. Um, to be honest, uh, people have asked that the last couple of days and um, me and the director or director and I, I should say, uh, being a writer, um, we, we pretty much got the same answer, which is when you're making something, you're not really thinking of anything approaching kind of legacy or, or what, what will people think in decades to come. You're thinking, yeah. can we get this finished? Can we get it out? Will they bring it? Will it go out? Will people see it? And that's the big moment, really, that, that we did actually get out and we did get it broadcast. And then a big sigh of relief because it actually existed. And then we can talk about what happened. That really. yeah. So uh, how did you become involved? How, how did this uh, ghost watch happen? Because I, I never saw it when it came out because it's a very British thing to do, sort of a, a, the idea of a ghost watch, a spring watch, an autumn watch, a whatever watch. You, we, we wouldn't be watching that in another country. So, yeah. It's... Yeah, there was, uh, there was cr cr I think we had watch, which was a longstanding kind of cop. Um, uh, you know, uh, the public were urged to help the cops with their inquiries kind of thing through the television um and i guess that was a kind of springboard for it in a sense but sarah green who was our roving reporter on ghost watch she'd also been i think hospital watch what she'd done so she'd already done a watch um so it was perfect fit for using her in in the drama really um it, it wasn't really we hadn't we hadn't had the tsunami of, of um we are reality tv as we now call it i'm not sure whether the word reality tv had quite can't be become what it, we understand it being now, but there was a certain climate in the early 90s. Um, drama's becoming uh, used to using uh, uh, documentary techniques like handheld camera to make them look uh, realistic and authentic. And uh, documentaries were using recreations, using actors. Um, so, so there was a blurring of lines between fact and fiction on TV. And, it, and that was part of, like I say, the language landscape against which we invented ghost watch in a way mm. so and, how did you become it, involved oh, sorry sorry, sorry I, I remembered your initial question that i hadn't answered which was <laughs> yeah my agent um put me in contact with the producer at the bbc called ruth baumgarten in the drama department and i initially pitched it as a six-part drama series, um conventional film series investigation kind of like a mystery series if you like with a supernatural edge to it. Um, the BBC didn't bite at that. It, it still was the idea of a kind of, um, an investigative reporter, a television reporter, getting in cahoots with a psychical researcher, and they're both 
investigate a haunted house was the concept. And it was still called Ghostwatch when it was a conventional drama. Uh, and they had that off the ground with the BBC. So Ruth said, could you think about it as a 90-minute single? Because there is a there is for one of those next autumn. And I said, well, instead of shoehorning the whole six episodes into 90 minutes, could we just do episode six, which was always in my head as being a so-called live a live transmission from a haunted house on Halloween night. So I said, why don't us, that's the nub of the idea, really. Why don't we do a live transmission from Halloween night? But why don't we do it as if it really is a live transmission by the BBC on Halloween night? Uh, and she, a jaw kind of dropped me, and I said, well, let's kind of go for it. You know, little thinking, really, that we'd pull it off, off but, uh, but at least we could attempt it, you know? Did a... Uh... I mean, obviously, we look at it now, and it's pretty obvious. I think it's pretty obvious that it was, you know, kind of made up. But back then, we were, we were more naive. We were, you know, a different type of people back then. Do you think you made it clear enough that it was fake? Well, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. If you ask someone at the BBC, they would answer differently. I mean, to me, it was a case of not that I think of Ghostwatch being a prank or a joke, but it's still telling a story you don't tell the punchline of the story before you tell the story that's a really bad storytelling so it's kind of like you don't say what you're about to see is not real because it kind of kills the drama uh, and the conceit of what you're watching and you, you kind of rob people of that ability to get involved and uh, get immersed in it possibly as they slowly realize oh this is a, just a drama done in a, in a hopefully clever different kind of way which is what i what i wanted um what I wanted more than anything is to, I was a TV addict as a kid and all we used to about is TV and films that we'd seen at the, at the weekends. So my dream really was that kids would go in on a Monday morning and all be talking about it. That's all I was thinking. Really. Not, not that they believed it, not that they were traumatized by it, but they would just, just be talking about it. And the great thing since is, you know, there was a whole wilderness for like 10 years before it came out on DVD. But when people did start discussing it, I had a rather wonderful kind of feedback of people that were usually around the age of 12 or 13 that had seen it at the time. There was, a, there was kind of a strange mixture of, oh, I was completely freaked out by it. I didn't sleep for a week. It terrified me. But it also got me really, I think it was a fantastic program. It's the best thing the BBC's ever done. And also it made me want to make my own horror films. And that's that's immensely gratifying. You can imagine what that makes you feel like. Like it's been a kind of pivotal, catalytic moment in, in people's creative um, thinking, which is which, which is wonderful, really. I mean, you're right. It's it's about the story, and I mean, you're not the first to have done a sort of a docu. What's the word? A documentary style of a horror, because I mean, Dracula itself, Frankenstein, they're all old letters and sent letters and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. So they're all the, it's, the, it's kind not... of the so-called found footage genre has kind of started in, in the Gothic era, which was all about letters from people to other. And uh, you know, it was very much in my mind that uh, ghost stories, if you think of the golden era of ghost stories, uh, they usually have the same format, which is they start off by someone saying, you're not going to believe what happened to me. Uh, mm. I know you're not going to believe it, but, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a kosher person. You can believe me, and I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. You're not going to believe it, but this really did happen. So in the back of my mind, I was thinking as a TV writer, as a screenwriter, what's the equivalent of that literary device where you're saying, to people know this really did happen to me and of course the television equivalent of that is you just stick a camera in someone's face and you say tell me what happened to you you know so uh right even though i grew up with the ghost stories for christmas and the mr james adaptations and all, all those kinds of things which were dramatized in the theatrical way like you'd expect um i didn't see the equivalent of what, what way a ghost story is done in literature which is that no this really happened and as you say the, the i mean the equivalent the, the idea for me also, you know, if Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story, say, about hypnotism, uh, he'd write it in such a way that it would slot into a magazine that's full of uh, non-fiction pieces and fiction pieces. So he deliberately would make it read like a non-fiction piece. That's more the equivalent of what I was doing because I wanted to sit in the schedule amongst other things and not be apparent immediately what kind of thing it was until you watch it, you know? Um, so, yeah, those were the pre precedents that I was aware of anyway. Very much Dracula, you know, as always transcripts, you know. And also the thing about Dracula I always remember is the, uh, the reference to uh, uh, 
um, one of the manuscripts, being, which must have been high technology in the 1890s, I should think, really. So the idea of technology coming into a, a ghost story as a kind of as a weapon against uh, ancient forces is uh, yeah, that, that's a long-standing idea as well, I think. I mean, the other thing that comes to mind, just as you say that, the uh, the radio version of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, people didn't know that at the time that that was uh, just a, yeah. a phony type of thing. And that caused as much grief as yours did. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, well, maybe, yeah. Not, not uh, as much, but, you know. Well, what, pe- what people um, forget about that is it was only the introductory maybe half hour or 20 minutes of that that's, that was fake. Um uh, it's a band show being interrupted by the news saying the Martians had landed. Then it went back to the dance band. Uh, and then pretty soon after that, it went into a conventional drama adaptation of War of the Worlds. So it wasn't even the whole program wasn't like that. It was just, and that, that 15, 20 minutes was enough to get people panicking, apparently. Yeah, um, okay. Well, so that, it, it was just a funny promo they did, and that caused a lot of problem. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So tell us what it was like on the night. I'd, I'd like to flash back and forward a bit because obviously, you know, my mind's going with all the kind of, you know, ramifications. Like, I'll, I'll, actually, I'll start with what was some of your inspiration for actually writing the story, the narrative of pipes and all these uh, all these uh, spooky goings on? Well, I know I get accused of kind of mirroring uh, the Enfield poltergeist. Um, it wasn't so, I mean, I had read that. That book it wasn't so much in my mind I wanted to reflect that um it was more i did a, i did what i thought was a kind of an amalgam of as many cases as i could think of and put them in a blender and that's the way they came out i mean maybe the fact it was set in london suburb there's a result and the fact that the kind of photographs of the kids bedroom were kind of uh intentionally or otherwise by the production team kind of looked like some of the photographs from Enfield. But it was set in Manchester, you know, so it wasn't a deliberate um, uh, uh, confabulation. And also I got um, Guy Playfair to chase the cast. Uh, I said to the producer, wouldn't it be good if we got someone that, that had been in a poltergeist situation to come and talk to the kids and the, the uh, Breeze who played the mother and tell tell them what it would like to be in that situation. You know, I remember being there with in the rehearsal room with, Parky was there and Parkinson and uh, Guy came along and I can't honestly remember what the conversation was, but I hope it was useful to the cast. Um, and I don't, th- I mean, if I was trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes, I can't see in any logical way I've invited him along to help us out. Mm. Um, so, so, so no, from my point of view, it was a universal kind of psychodrama of a poltergeist nature, really. It had aspects of the Battersea poltergeist, I felt, so when I was watching it, and it was just little bits and pieces from other things. It wasn't just Enfield. You're right. It, it, because it was London in a council house, it felt like Enfield, but there was lots of other things that was, you know, which was what made it actually really quite interesting. So you, you took those. It must have been quite exciting having, you know, people like Michael Parkinson, Sarah Green and co. involved because that added to that this is what you'd ha- you'd expect for a proper TV show, well, isn't that, it? Well, well that was the great thing about the cast now i wasn't really privy to the casting whenever i wrote a draft of the script uh, i got bored with saying um anchor man or interviewer or expert no I, the made-up characters would have names but the other characters would be called reporter or comedian or or anything and it looked so dry on the script so i put people's actual names in you know from tv sometimes it would be nick ross from crime watch or it would be uh, Jonathan Dimbleby from Question Time. And I jot these names in to just throw them out. You know, every time I did a draft, it would be a name. I put a different comedian on the street, you know, that kind of thing. But none of those actually became the ones that were used in the end, um, uh, which was nice. And I, I'm so, so pleased that, I mean, when it, when they told me that Parkinson was going to do it, you know, inevitably, I thought, oh, bloody hell, can, I mean, can they get anywhere near kind of acting or being convincing? Because sometimes people, can be TV personalities, but find it very difficult to be convincing as themselves. It's a, it's a kind of paradox in a way. I thought um, he was the best one in it. I thought he, besides the kids, <laughs> he was the most yeah. realistic because he had that kind of grumpiness. He just knows behind that kind of, you know, not taking it's the, uh, Yorkshire, the Yorkshire yeah. skepticism, which was perfect. That was an added added bonus. It really was. And the interesting so, thing, this- thing that, sorry, just to fill in the casting, because I think it's quite interesting, we weren't 
planning for Mike Smith and Sarah Green to be in it together. Uh, we sent it to Sarah Green and she wanted to do it. And I think it was a case of Mike Smith looking over her shoulder and reading and saying, is there a path in it for me? Kind of thing. So the producer rang me and said, could we get Mike Smith in it? And uh, it took me all of 10 seconds to think, to do, to do all the, my computer going over. Uh, there was a massive bonus to have a TV couple and one was in a haunted house and one was unable to help them. You know, that, that became a, a, a kind of, you can't imagine the drama now without that really yeah no that that does it because so watching it and thinking what you'd, you'd be thinking if your wife or your husband's uh you know in yeah. danger that added another yeah, yeah. level to it and, and, and that's what the, other level, the other level was um sorry to interrupt the other level was no, the idea right. it, it uh, emphasized this uh theme that i i was hoping would come across which is um that the family have, have got a surrogate mother in the scientist but they've also got the surrogate family when the television crowd descends and um the fact that it's a celebrity couple you know we we all relate to these people on tv and they are, they do feel like family and you do you do kind of get attached to them sometimes you see them more than your own family so it so it really was helpful for the for the theme of the thing you know our relationship with tv because it's all about the audience in a in a in a, in a horror story sense ghost uh, ghost watch is about be careful what you wish for the audience wishes to see a ghost and that's what causes the ghost to appear yeah and then you know uh all hell breaks loose as you as you know but, but um so so in that sense it's a, it it hopefully delivers what a ghost story does and uh, be careful what you wish for but it's the audience that wishes for it you know well that was it was the national well we, the seance you know and all that kind of stuff so yeah, that, yeah. which was cool <laughs> tell us about the filming in the night so I'm assuming you were on you were on set somewhere, or, or where were you well, while this was all going on? Well, we were all at a screening because it was filmed in July uh, over, okay. over a period of, of like four weeks. They shot all the exterior stuff at the house first, exterior and interior stuff at the house, uh, and they had to edit all that stuff because there were various takes, uh, long takes, like ten or fifteen minute take, um, sometimes. Um, that took a lot of rehearsal, uh, edit that and then go in the studio so that Parkinson and Gillian uh, Levin, the actress, could react to what was projected on the screen beside them. So none of that was live. None of that was going on at the same time. They had to be done in two chunks. And actually, I think they were done with even two different kind of crews because the studio, studio operators are not the same union as the film people that would have been on location so the, there were all sorts of complications technically about how it was shot you know okay so you watched it you what you see so you, you're watching on the night in on a, in a screening yeah you weren't uh, yeah. okay so when did you find out that the you know maybe some of the chaos had started around the country um well really when it when it finished um we were waiting for ruth baumgarn the producer to come back from television center she was there uh kind of making sure it goes out on time <laughs> making sure it actually goes live and when she was leaving she saw the technicians from one of the studios standing looking at the big screen in the in the lobby of television center really worried about what the hell's going on in studio three uh and we started to realize then that it was having a bit of a different impact than we thought it would um but and when she arrived at the um the club where we had the screening and we were having drinks with um, Sarah and Mike and various men, cast and crew. Um, she looked a bit ashen when she came in and she said, you know, there's been 30,000 calls to the switchboard. The switchboard is jammed with complaints. And I kind of, I remember I kind of laughed because I thought you're having us on. Um, but she said, no, there's, there's people getting really upset about, about this. And I could quite believe it, you know, uh, I rather naive thought that people some people given that millions of people watch tv okay, okay and millions of different people watch tv not everyone even if you did put a caption at the beginning not everyone's going to see that there was a cast list in video times not everyone gets the tv guide or the radio times not everyone sees the beginning of something um and some people thought it was really going on you know and some people wander into a show halfway through and they didn't see the beginning or the middle or they might have missed the ending and various things so so I was expecting really that people might kind of go along with it 10, 15 minutes and then realize 
that they sit read between the lines and realize oh no this is this is constructed like a drama and we're being told a story here. but and indeed a lot of people did i think I, I think the people that enjoyed it most kind of did both partly kind of believed it and immersed themselves in it and partly knew that they were being told a ghost story so it, there's a funny kind of play uh what, what would you call it? a suspension of disbelief i guess that enjoyable uh, uh, an enjoyable immersion and what's going on you, know? you you might believe it but who cares it's great i'm loving this i don't yeah, care if he's a real ghost he's yeah. gonna kill them all go for it i mean i've heard from i've heard from people this week because i've done a few interviews because of the anniversary and some people said i i can be freaked out because i thought jesus we've just seen proof of the supernatural in front of our eyes this is like a ghost that's been caught on screen and it's kind of like it, it kind of blew their mind because they suddenly, what are we going to, who can I ring and tell about this? This is mind blowing, you know? I'm not saying everyone reacted like that, far from it. Some people were really um, sucked into the possibility that they'd be experienced something supernatural. Um, and I think that was, uh, there's many reasons why paranormal experts kind of turned against it. But I think, I think that is the main reason people against it with because it was a kind of manufactured supernatural experience i mean deliberately so but when when people have specifically been um investigating the supernatural uh you know it sticks in their core the idea that a dramatist like me will will play around with that for whatever reason i did uh, which i thought was good reason um but i never really wanted it to even though I wanted the conceit to operate in a certain way because it was a thriller, it was a ghost story, and it had that form underneath it, I never wanted to make a paranormal investigation as a, uh, as a vocation ridiculous. I really went out of my way that the scientist, even though she's a kind of Cassandra figure, you know, that thinks she's right, but she turns out to be wrong, uh, I never wanted her to be foolish. And I, you know, I knew lots of people in in the scientific community that I had a lot of respect for uh, and their research I had a lot of respect for. <laughs> and I didn't get any any thanks whatsoever from the community of, or the SPR or anybody like that for actually trying to write a kind of investigator that was kind of plausible and believable. Um, I thought she was all right. But, I think she was one of the better characters on the show. I, yeah. I hated that one in America, the one that was in the <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're, no, you're, meant no. to, you're meant to hate him. <laughs> yeah. no, the dollar quote, which will be go, well, whatever it is, I don't believe it, so it's all wrong. So, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. so uh, do you think it's, I mean, it's, a, we're talking 1992 here. It's before the internet. It's, you know, we, you know, DVDs aren't even been around much at that stage. You know, we're, we're that early on in the piece. Do you think it's just, you know, the naivety of the, the people of the time? To actually be able to believe something like, because there's been so much since you just couldn't believe that anymore it wouldn't matter what was on your screen now i wouldn't believe the news never well, mind that's the, that's the weird thing is that 30 years later it's almost like you know i don't think we were prescient we, we, i think we were unknowingly prescient about the way television was going in terms of the way a tv audience can affect uh people that appear on tv i mean and look at the people that were affected when they won big brother you know jane Jade, Jade Goody and all the rest of it, people, or, or people on Love Island, you know, that terrible things kind of happen because of the pressure that audience expectation puts on, puts on them. And the wider context of social media is even, even more kind of uh, damning or vitriolic or, or dismissive or um, binary, if you like, than, 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 than anything we, we could expect in the 90s. Um, mm. So we, I don't think we predicted that but what what was we're really commenting on the 1990 situation which is which as i say the blurring of fact and fiction and just be careful what you're looking at be careful what you're being told if that person's it struck me really that any person can appear on screen as dr blogs or um you know uh, uh, you know boris johnson or whatever that is but you know mm -hmm. professor so and so it's just a word who knows what you know and you get that every night now on say news night right? mm. someone says they're at the office of fiscal studies or the economic professor of the so and so and you've got no real uh, way of gauging whether they know what they're talking about or not they get wheeled on but we don't know their actual sense of authority and and i think we are now suspicious of it 
but the trouble is someone says someone i read a great quote the other day is that when there's so much lying around it's not that it's not that you start it, it the, the result is that you start suspecting the tr truth <laughs> so that that is the unfortunate result of a lot of liars being around um and i thought that was that was an excellent observation because I find that I find myself doing it. You, you believe nothing. You know? well, that's what I've heard about the whole idea of Putin with all the you know all the the misinformation. Yeah, yeah. It's not about not believing that stuff. It's just we don't believe anything anymore. Yeah, absolutely. So no matter what you told someone, I don't believe it, and that's the whole thing through COVID and all through things. People won't accept any kind of facts huh? because they'll they'll pick their facts nowadays. And and because people like Putin or any any kind of dictator, they don't surround themselves with experts because experts deal in, in facts and they know more than that. They surround themselves with basically cronies who would back who, who would back them up because they that they would keep them safe. And it happened. Well, dare I say it happened here w with Boris Johnson being surrounded by people and uh, and definitely Trump. Uh, you know the way he rode roughshod over over scientists was was beyond embarrassing you know um so anyway but we digress um i'm not but anyway I, I, I would say it kind of pointed a little bit in the direction of of what we're living through fakeness in a sense um or wagged a finger in that direction um you know i think really just said be well, careful I think the, next, the next step in the tale though is we then got the reality paranormal tv so come the 2000s most haunted and all these other programs were doing the same thing what what do, what do you think of paranormal television today uh i mostly don't see any of it because it's on channels i don't really watch but when i flick it when i'm in a hotel room and i'm flicking channels by the time i get to 35 or 40 <laughs> in the numbers i see oh ghost paranormal ghost ghost ranch idaho and this kind of thing or or the ghost my ghost next door and, and there's loads yeah. of them and and I, I i came back from a screening of ghost watch on saturday and you know when you've done an event it's a bit of a kind of calm down i couldn't go straight to bed so i put the yeah. tv on and there was one of these damn th things on the tv and i switched it on and i swear it was the same techniques we just watched in in ghost watch like the night vision and the reactions and the shining the torch around and that kind of thing oh, oh my god people jumping out and god knows what it was the same kind of shtick i mean the big difference for me is i never want to take responsibility really for uh, most haunted because for me even though there's a superficial resemblance which who knows what might be maybe entirely accidental but um maybe not uh i think we were setting out to do different things like i say my remit or my um dramatic um question if you like was to say to the audience be careful what you're looking at and uh, you know, for what you're seeing, are you, are you being manipulated and that kind of thing? And I, I don't think as a program, Most Haunted was doing that. Most Haunted was providing entertainment for people that are basically superstitious uh, and enjoyed the, the frisson of um, of a ghost experience. So I, th I think mm. I think that I think there is a resemblance, but I think the intention was very different. It could well be just the mediums, the similar similarity. You know, it's similar medium. You're doing an investigation, therefore there's going to be look. So uh, yeah, yeah. it looks the same. It's just and it's paranormal, so therefore yeah, that's yeah. the thing. So, if you were to, I mean, could you do Ghost Watch? I mean, you could do Ghost Watch today, but would it just be another? Would it be sort of a another most haunted, but maybe a few more scares in it or something like that? How would you do it? I don't think it would have the impact if you're the same way, and I'm not sure the the real reason to do it to be honest i mean i think they've done most haunted with the stars of coronation street yeah. or all the you know and it's kind of like all the things we all the things like not all the things that, that would be grand of me to say that but sort of like a lot of the things that i was dreaming dreaming up to go into uh, ghost watch as, as fiction uh you just you just you would actually do it for real now you wouldn't bother writing a drama about it you'd actually construct construct a reality show which actually was Ghost to Watch on Halloween, and actually did have the presenter, and actually did have people telling their ghost stories, and did have the experts in the studio, and maybe nothing would happen, or maybe something would happen, who knows? But if I was doing it again, I wouldn't bother fictionalizing it. I'd just maybe take the format and just do it and see what happens. 
Okay, so you probably maybe but have I, a but, I, <laughs> <laughs> but people say, you know, uh, certainly in the years afterwards, oh, can we? Can you? Can you do something like that? And I'm like, no, you can't do something like that. Oh, can you do another one like it? No, I can't do another one like it. Oh, what what would you do if you were? No, I can't do it. It's, I I always say, um, and I've said a few times in interviews that, uh, you know, it's not up to me to come up with the next one. It's up to somebody else to do the next one. <laughs> and I would be the most delighted person to be shocked and and scared and um, maybe outraged by whatever the next person comes up with in a way that I could didn't dream of you know um so would you uh, I'm, I'm sorry go ahead oh, sorry, i was just going to say like looking back on it if you could go back to your 1992 self to redo any of it would you would you redo any of it would you add you know i always thought it would be cool if like you know michael parkinson became you know you know possessed or so, i don't know but just something a little bit different to what it was the only thing i i kind of regret but god knows what happened um if we had done it was my my original intention in the script was um uh not that parkinson's really kind of reads the possessed auto cue round and round the golden eddie bear uh that the the idea was that they sense that the ghost is in the machine and the ghost is coming to your tv set and going to be in your home yeah. uh and that's and it's coming you know it i i thought of the um punning idea that pipes would be in the pipes coming to your home but that's the kind of thought is it's going to be because television comes into your home then it comes into everyone's home so if he's in the studio he'd come to everyone's home so i kind of like this idea in a kind of quite mass nigel kind of way that parkinson it would finish with parkinson saying you've got to switch off the tv set you've got to switch off now switch off now you know and then it cuts to black and the producer when i said that the producer said there's no way in hell you're going to do any of that stuff. You can for, you can forget that right now. But there's part of me just wondering that that as a as a form of the story would have been the perfect ending, really. But I can see why she was afraid to do it. Yeah, I don't think they really television stations want you to turn their TV off, do they? They want you to watch the next show, don't they? So, so there was obviously, and it, I, I, when you read these things, it says that it, there was a, a million phone calls, and you're telling me it's thirty thousand, but you know, obviously things change over the years. No, say a million, a big, say two million. Two million, you know, every person I love, in Britain. I love, the, I love the mythology. It's, it's changes by the I love it. Yeah, so well, that's I think that's what the advertising is. I don't know. Anyway, I'm sure it's it's there anyway. But the obviously the legacy over the last thirty years, it's built. It was you know, they say banned, which I don't know that really means banned because it just meant that it wasn't shown on the television again. You don't you don't show the weather twice, so I don't know why you would show a, a news program twice. Mm. Um, how, how's it meant for your career? This what, what you know? Obviously, each Halloween, this is becoming a staple. Uh, well, I get a, definitely get a flurry of activity and a flurry of kind of interviews, or certainly a, a, a spike in social media things and. Which is quite nice. I mean, it amazes me that people still remember it and kind of celebrate it. And it, it, you know, some people uh, uh, take it as a regular thing that they're going to watch it every Halloween. I mean, I've even heard that. Actually, I heard directly because I was working with Phil Quinson, the, the producer of Doctor Who, and he said that Russell T. Davis watches it every Halloween. <laughs> I was amazed by that, you know. And uh, and the next minute he was on the phone to him and he said oh, i'm here working with Stephen." you know and so that was a nice that was a nice thought i got very kind from uh, russell t davis and, and also like amazing quotes from people like uh, guillermo del toro saying it's you know ghost watch is fantastic it's so scary and orin pelly who directed paranormal activity he's on record saying that it was a big influence on his film so you know you must have done something right along the way i think well, that's right, and I think I think a lot of people out there. Now, just before before we finish up, I I missed you at the ASAP conference. You were there, I think, on the Sunday, and I was there on the Saturday this year. Yeah, and, uh, I, I enjoyed your talk. Pass. Yeah, I enjoyed your talk very much. It was a great. Evening. Oh, you were in the, you were you were actually oh, there yeah. on the day. I didn't see you. Sorry, oh, you I didn't realise. Oh, I've known yeah. that all of a sudden. Low. So <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I I don't really do talk, so it was a bit bit like you know. I was, uh, I was, uh, I was sort of like in a bit of a daze, and I had a cold as well, so it wasn't it. But you're obviously very interested in ghosts as a thing. You're not just sort of, you know. Sometimes you talk to authors and stuff like that. And this week we're writing about ghosts, and next week we'll talk about an orange giraffe, and next week we'll do motor racing. Yeah. What 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 is it about ghost stories that you like? 
Well, it's, it's kind of a long story. I'll try and keep it brief. I guess I grew up with horror stories and ghost stories. I'm always interested in kind of pan books of horror stories or the Fontana uh, anthology of, uh, of stories. Grew up with that. Grew up with Hammer films and spooky films. Just, I think you either, you either um, kind of respond to that as a genre or you don't. And I, I, get, I don't think it's entirely to do with belief what's going on it's more kind of visceral reaction to the storytelling and i've i suppose as i've got older i've tried to kind of analyze it originally to a certain extent and i think part of, part of the attraction of horror is to do with, with being a kind of anxiety based as, a, as i think of myself you know it's kind of like everything is slightly fearful you know that kind of thing but but really the the attraction for ghost stories in particular and i've always written them um is that in storytelling terms, the ghost can be a metaphor for so many different things. Um, and it's a kind of poetic form in a story. It, it takes you out of reality. And, um, uh, you know, a ghost can represent grief a lot of the time. So it's a, it's a, it's a neat way to actually uh, represent loss and grief, or it can be a kind of injustice, uh, um, can be, you know, revenge, or any, any number of specific situations can be, um, dramatized or how can I say um, embellished or amplified by adding supernatural elements and mm. there's plenty of plenty of, plenty of writers can address human dilemmas emotional dilemmas without using supernatural things but to me it's kind of um, it's like I don't know uh, putting a magnifying glass on a situation to add a supernatural element you know it makes it vivid and uh, makes you explore it in a different way. I mean, I, I wrote a, a series called Afterlife, not the Ricky Gervais one, but yep. one yep. about a medium and an investigator of a, of a medium. And um, uh, in that, I, you can have, have a conversation between a dead person and a, and a live person, which you can't do in a in a naturalistic drama. Um, and that kind of thing, it offers, it, it opens up the imagination. Really, I suppose that's what I find. Ghost stories are have an opening for the imagination, and um, uh, yeah, that's what that's what I love doing to the characters. I enjoyed uh, watching a film a couple of months ago called The Awakening, which is a film that oh, you yeah. wrote for two thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I just stumbled across that, and I saw your name, and I thought, oh, I have to watch this because I didn't, you know, some of the things you'd see on Prime, you know, maybe not so good. But I thought that was that well, I've got to say, lots of fun. I thought yeah. it was it was a, it, it was really good. I I, I quite enjoy that kind of, you know. Uh, what we do, it's a haunted house drama, but there was things going on and you didn't quite know. And then I felt a bit foolish at the end when I thought I should have saw that coming, but I didn't, you know, all that kind of thing. So, you know, and, and that's, and that is exactly what you're talking about. Those people yeah. dealing with grief from the past exactly. or regret and, you know, and it's a ghost. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I, uh, in that one in particular, part of the inspiration for that was, uh, you know, Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. I always remember someone saying about Vertigo that it was a detective story where the detective himself is the mystery uh, and I thought well, I wonder if you can do a, a, a ghost story where the ghost hunter is the mystery in, that's, that, so it's about her or her or him um, so you know I hadn't seen a story that's about the person doing the investigating uh, yeah. and, and the idea of, and then the idea like the old you know Harry Houdini accusation the person that's the debunker is actually hiding part of themselves, and they really, if they really knew what they were about, they would become a different person. And I always think with ghost stories, it's kind of like for me, an encounter with the supernatural uh, uh, kind of finds its way. This is going to sound a little bit pretentious, but I was like flawed characters or characters with kind of wounds, and it's kind of like the supernatural opens up that wound, and you're either going to be destroyed by it, or it's going to illuminate the rest of your life, and you. And kind of until the end of the story, you don't know which way it's going to go, kind of thing. So it's either yeah. revelation or destruction. Um, and I kind of, I kind of like, like that the supernatural or spirituality, in a way, can be lead to the bad things or good things. You know, um, mm -hmm. I, Peter Laws, who was at the ASAP conference, yep. he he gave a. I don't know if you saw his talk, but no, it I was didn't. absolutely great. It really, it really was i'm not blowing smoke but it really was a kind of light bulb moment for me because um uh he said about that, that a lot of people there were neither completely skeptic nor complete believers but 
almost paranormalists in the middle. And I thought, that's exactly what I am. And he said, the par- people interested in the paranormal is it's a surrogate version of being spiritual. And I suddenly realized that everything I write about is a kind of, in a, in a roundabout way, is a way of writing about uh, spiritual things. Even Ghost Watch, in a way, is about, in a bizarre way, um, you know, what is the most profound question that he humanity can ask what happens after death okay but what would he say do with that question they'd make a light entertainment program but it's still in question tackled songs and, songs and praises about that yeah, thing but yeah you know, that's a but, uh, tackled with na- naivety and stupidity and triviality but but it's still uh, essential human kind of question at the end of the day you know um so, so yeah i just that i like the whole length Landscape of those things really, and what I, and most of what I do is in that in that area. I think whether I, whether I like it or not. Okay. Well, I, want, I do want to finish up, but I also don't want to finish up because I've got so many other questions. I want to ask you one question, and then I'll get back to Ghostwatch because we know that there's a new uh, Blu-ray coming out of Ghostwatch. I want to talk to you about that because there's some new things on that that I, I want to understand. Why why do I need to you know get another version when I've got my you know my <laughs> one version well, here? Well, actually, a lot of a lot of people haven't got a version of it, and people ask me all the time i can't get a hold of a copy of it and um i think there are some good new extras there's some extra bonus kind of commentary tracks there's the some of the old stuff from the bfi version that uh the director and i and the producer that commentary track is still on there's a new documentary but this was made by um sarah appleton who interviewed a lot of us and she made a wonderful documentary called the found footage phenomenon um so that was fun and i think she's done a great job of that and uh i think it's got my short story that's a sequel uh, stuff stuff like that and and i think it's the best possible picture you can get really i think they went back to make it kind of hd and, and that kind of thing when, yeah, when I was, I, what yeah. uh they they showed uh they showed the hd version at the screening i went to um at the weekend and it looks looks damn good so I would, I would okay. uh, urge people. All right, well, it's, it's worth me, what, what's the word, uh, upgrading up or whatever the word is yeah. when you get to <laughs> go from this. But no, the thing I want to leave you on is Gothic. Right. Now, it's a fantastic film. And I just want anyone who would have had to deal with Ken Russell, I want to ask some questions about, tell me about that experience. We'll leave people with the your your vision of Gothic, which is bloody bizarre. <laughs> so let me, let me, tell me about it, please. <laughs> well, it was actually it wasn't it wasn't too traumatic. It wasn't too much of a baptism of the fire. I mean, he was he was really quite uh, a teddy bear, to be honest. Enfant terrible and bad noir that he was was actually a, a bit of a, a, like I say a teddy bear. I mean, I, I did I was witness to his uh, uh, blowing off the you know uh, losing his top so to speak, uh, occasionally. But I think that wouldn't be a director if you didn't do that occasionally. But, I, I mean, he didn't... I should have... I'll be honest with you, I should have kind of treasured the experience more at the time. It was the first film I was involved in. Uh, I went along to the set several times and really enjoyed it. But I felt like a spare part uh, because there was nothing really to do. Um, so I just kind of looked around around with this continual and just chatted to people um but i kind of thought you know the director's working with the actors and doesn't really write her around anymore nice. uh i can occasionally would come up with new scenes like he in in, in, the, in the script uh when the uh, you know the fusily painting of the nightmare and it comes to life i don't know if you remember that but um so ken decided it would come to there would be a dwarf squatting on the chair Chest of yeah. Natasha. Um, that was never in the script. It, it was, it was kind of like that. The painting was a presence in the whole house, but I didn't, I didn't really dramatize it as a scene. And that's the difference between my script really and his is that I think he wanted to really get inside the fantasy aspects and bring it all alive in a vivid kind of way, um, rather than alluding to something with, with a, a kind of. Uh, I was going to say salty. That rather kind of puts it down. I didn't mean that. But he's got a very kinetic visual sense yeah. of storytelling. He doesn't want a lot of people, you know, around the dinner table talking. He wants to see get inside their head, you know. Um, so that was the that was the difference. But um, a bit of a bit of a rude awakening to actually see that first cut, because it wasn't what I was expecting 
expecting the film to be. I expect it to be a bit more kind of um, uh, sedate in a way, in terms of s speed and pace. And but it, but that's always the same when you've written something. It takes you a while, even with Ghostwatch, to give it the passing of time and then to accept what it is, because it's never the same as it was when it came out of your typewriter, you know. Um, and it and now it's now it's a uh, Ken Russell film forever, and I'm. I've made peace with that, really, I suppose I'd say. It is, and that's fantastic. Well, anyway, thank you very much for that, Stephen. It's been really great talking today. We went through a few subjects. We spoke all lots about Ghostwatch. I'm going to put down in the bottom how people can uh, get their new copy of uh, – or new or – first copy of uh, yeah. Ghostwatch and they can uh, be like Russell T Davies and watch it for Halloween if they get it quick enough. Or well, Actually, I take that back. I don't think they can get the new Blu-ray until next month, but I'm sure they'll be able to find it somewhere to watch it for their Halloween. I, I, if I were for them, I would order it as soon as possible because you, you never know. It might be out early. It might arrive on the day and you can... That would be the perfect... <laughs> It might, sell, it might sell out. It might sell out, and they need to get their copy right away. Buy two and one for their mum. Okay, there you go. <laughs> exactly, there you go. Absolutely. All right. Thank you Thanks very, very much. much there, Stephen. You have a great Thanks night. A okay, bye-bye. You too. Thank you.